Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, having me and uh, inviting me to deliver this inaugural keynote webinar for management and sustainability and Arab review, which I think is an exciting new journal. Um, it is for that reason that it is my very pleasure and uh, an honor to uh, talk a little bit more about what this kind of journal and particularly MSAR uh, can, in my opinion, contribute to the discussion of uh, responsible management, which is um, the area of research that I'm extremely interested in. And uh, I think there's a very strong explicit link between sustainability and, uh, uh, and management and uh, responsi responsible management because sustainable management or sustainability management are two of the uh, kind of con uh, uh, main contributing disciplines or areas or phenomena um, that's run also into the responsible management uh, interdiscipline, which uh, uh, is focusing on all three of them, bringing together ethics, responsibility, and sustainability in the managerial context. Um, so I would, want, I would like to see how particularly this idea of globalization, of globalizing in management, uh, can lend itself to building a very, very exciting research agenda for MSAR. So let's have a look at how this goes. Good, there we are. So globalizing responsible management in the Arab region, the need for MSAR, MSAR and promising areas of research. This is what you came for. What unfortunately I won't be able to give you though, might be some of the things that you might expect to be in that presentation. I want to be clear about them from the very beginning. So what I won't talk about is what we can learn from about or for responsible management in the Arab region. Um, because I am not from the Arab region. I'm not somebody conducting research in the Arab region, but I think I can do something, uh, something, something to enable the process or to help enable the process of getting that what kind of knowledge about it. Because MSAR and building MSAR is exactly this, uh, building that kind of knowledge which is so important and so valuable. But what I will talk about and what I can talk about is um, some point is about how we can build on practice of globalization um, to learn uh, from and about or for responsible management in the Arab region, and uh, also to find out how this actually implies a very exciting research agenda and to um, highlight some additional resources from my own work that I think could be helpful to, uh, um, to use in that context. So globalizing first. Globalizing, what the hell is this? Um, many many people actually uh, um, have been uh, quite uh, uh, quite confused about this term itself. By now, I think it has established itself a little bit more than in the beginning when you first wrote this first book there on the left side, first edition of our textbook. Um, and actually, a f funny anecdote there that the uh, the editors and the different proofreaders looking at this book over time, three of them actively corrected the title, the second title from global sustainability, responsibility and ethics to global sustainability, responsibility ethics. And I had to be on my toes really to make sure that this book is not published with the wrong title for that very reason. Um, and then actually translated this uh, globalizing theme into the second edition of the book as well, where we have an entire chapter only focused on globalizing. And uh, this is also what I will use briefly just to share my idea about what globalizing means and what we can do with it, really. Um, globalization, we know, all, uh, all of us know, and we, uh, we have quite a good grasp of and uh, uh, probably personal experiences with. Um, however, what happens when we bring together the global and the local, if you're not interested into that move to the global dominantly, but actually in the dynamics, the ongoing moves back and forth between global and local, local and global, global and local. Um, and this is what I, I uh, refer to with globalizing as a practice. And this practice in management is something that you can do responsibly or less responsibly. And if you think about those contributing areas of responsible management, about sustainability, responsibility, and ethics, well, this means if you're doing locally responsible management, you're actually um, catering to the stakeholders, global and local, global stakeholders. So you assume your stakeholder responsibility in both areas. Um, you're doing something that's morally uh, legitimate, acceptable, good, if you want so, if you want to want to stay in a normative language from the ethics lens, uh, a lens that uh, brings together the values as much from uh, uh, some kind of globally shared values 
and the locally uh, unique values. But at the same time, it's also a type of management uh, whose impact is both um, globally and locally at least sustainable, hopefully even in the future for many companies, restorative. So, um, but what does that mean if you look at a couple of um, case examples? Um, so it can manifest in many different ways. One way how uh, I, I like to see it manifest is that of the uh, cosmetics company Natura, which is um, from uh, operating out of the, uh, the Amazon in Manaus in Brazil. Um, and they are actually very, very closely connected to the local dimension because most of their cosmetics are based on local ingredients, natural ingredients from the Amazon uh, and local knowledge. Uh, very often it's indigenous knowledge um, about the, the healing uh, and, uh, and beauty creating cosmetic properties of plants most of the time. Um, but also it, of course, creates, creates that connection to um, having the, the, the global level, because this is a global corporation um, and customs in many other countries benefiting from that local advantage that, that there exists. So we see the dynamics between global and local are there almost automatically in this case. Uh, but then also we can think about something that's a little bit more balanced between different locations. So if we th think about joint ventures like this one here between Cycle and, and uh, Uon, two of the, uh, the big uh, bicycle sharing platforms, um, there we actually see that uh, very often it's a more equal combination uh, or, or, or meeting of the different localities of the different local uh, cultural aspects in this case between the UK, uh, Cambridge and uh, China, I, I believe Yuan is, uh, is out of, uh, out of Suzhou. Um, so the idea there is to bring those two together once again and to, to study and to build on the dynamics between global and local. And the global dimension here is actually one that only is touched on briefly while you're moving between China and the, the UK very, very quickly in that kind of business, which is so physically um, located in a certain place as, uh, as bicycle sharing, the global level is one that really moves, moves into the background. Um, and then a third example, which I like very much because I have a lot of Mexican, um, <clears throat> Mexican family, is uh, that of Coco, the, uh, um, the, the Disney movie that came out, uh, I think, uh, three or four years ago. Um, <clears throat> because also there's certain dangers in those dynamics between global and local. And one of the main dangers is uh, cultural appropriation. So the idea that we are actually taking something from a certain culture locally, often from uh, a, an indigenous group, um, and we are taking it in, in a way that actually doesn't do the, either doesn't do them justice. So we are we are we are changing it and making it look bad, or don't look, make it look authentic anymore. Or on the other hand, it might also be that we are profiting from it, but we're not really giving back to the origin. Um, so there, there's a certain uh, a certain danger inherently. But I think this is actually a very good example because. I always uh, compare Coco with uh, one of the first James Bonds uh, 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 that, that Daniel Craig did. So you might remember that he was uh, in Mexico City and dancing through that Day of the Death parade, which is uh, actually ha happens to be just yesterday. Yesterday was Day of the Death. Um, a, a very traditional and ancient uh, uh, Mexican, uh, Mexican festival. And it was very, very strongly misrepresented. I remember sitting in, in the, the, the movies between my wife and she was saying, yeah, this is not right because she, she's Mexican, so she would know. Um, but then on the other hand, I also remember sitting right next to her uh, watching Coco, and she was excited, exhilarated about it because she, she said, well, this is really how it is. And this is um, doing justice to, to our culture and it's elevating this culture and making something out of it that other people can appreciate and that they, that they like Mexico for. Um, so you can get it right and you can get it wrong. And as you see from that new movie example, in the very same industry, very similar uh, production processes, you can actually go into both directions. Um, so, but how I typically understand localizing, how I like to study it is all of those different um, practices that managers engage automatically in their day to day that navigate the global and the local. And uh, I think it's happening to a degree that those are actually those localizing practices or this mode of management that we call globalizing just goes along with other modes that we are probably more familiar with, like organizing, strategizing, uh, communicating, and so on. So this is the idea. But um, if, if you're wondering, what does that have to do with our academic work here? 
Um, you're right, because right now I'm talking about managerial practice of globalizing, but we can actually have um, academic practice of globalizing as well. And uh, I think um, there are particularly three areas of how that kind of academic practice of globalizing could work for MSAR. So first of all, I think you could problematize unique local issues and you could use that journal as a platform for problematizing, studying and finding solutions. Um, or actually not even going all the way to the solution stage, but only to, to use that kind of academic um, discourse in order to about the problems themselves. Um, the second one would be um, the, the topic of colonializing or rather decolonializing um, responsible management in the, in the Arab region. Um, so how can we actually, uh, and well, well let's, let's wait with that colonialization topic just uh, uh, until we get there in a moment. Um, because I don't want to get too deeply into it at this point. Um, but then we could also elevate or and or celebrate unique Arab approaches. So a little bit similar to what we've seen with Coco and the Day of the Death um, example from Mexico, where there's something very unique, valuable that we can actually, through the journal, um, bring to a greater audience. So particularly if you think about uh, sustainability there might be a practice in the Arab region that is not very well known globally, and we are able to use the journal as a platform to make it make it known. So um, I think those are, are very interesting approaches, and I will try to or, or starting points, um, and I will try to give you a little bit more more uh, beef onto the bones, a little bit more meat onto the bones um, of the, this very basic scaffold, and uh, some ideas on how that could start, how you could start working on either one of those three. Um, and particularly for those local issues, concerns, and challenges, I think there's two areas that I personally think would be very promising um, to, uh, to build on. So the first one is the situated nature of management practices. And the second one is about the idea of transdisciplinary responsible management learning, or if you want to so transdisciplinary learning for uh, sustainability and management. Um, so how could we do that? And one, one starting point might be um, to, uh, to, to build on uh, that paper that Sylvia Girardi and I uh, just very recently published in the Journal of Business Ethics, where we're actually outlining how to do practice-based studies. I, I strongly believe that practices are the most powerful levers for change when it comes to sustainability and responsibility and ethics, but we need to study them very, very profoundly. We need to understand them very well in order to actually navigate them or, or um, uh, change them, them in a way that leads to that greater transformation that we're overall looking for. And one of the, the uh, so why don't we do that? Actually tapping into this rich repertoire that theories of practice has given us. So far, practice studies in that, that, uh, that area haven't used theories of practice. Uh, and it's a shame because it can give us so much stronger insights into the internal workings of practice and particular patterns um, or, and dynamics of change. Um, so you could use that situatedness uh, principle, which is the very first one we had to have here in this, um, in this table, uh, in order to very, very closely, very tightly situate your practice study, your study of sustainability management in the Arab region. So that would be one way. Um, and the other one is uh, uh, about the idea of transdisciplinarity. So um, I, I would find it immensely exciting if um, some of the first submissions to the journal, or some of the first uh, published articles in the journal actually would, would be based on some kind of trans transdisciplinary learning for responsible management. So all of us know interdisciplinarity. So the idea that we are actually moving or, or drawing from knowledge uh, in different uh, disciplines, like uh, um, from, uh, let's say, biology and uh, uh, management, for instance, when we are talking about biomimetic management, um, or we are thinking about the, um, let's say, the, the natural science and physics um, together with uh, sociology in some cases. So this is transdisciplinarity, right? Um, uh, sorry, interdisciplinarity. But the idea is that there's actually more stocks of knowledge that we can engage in collaborative practices than just different disciplines. Uh, and this is where transdisciplinarity comes in, because then if you're talking about transdisciplinarity, you're also looking at knowledge in different sectors. So there might be the same discipline um, living or working in, uh, in different sectors. So there might be people who are biologists, for instance, in 
the public sector will work in an environmental for instance. There might be biologists who are working in academia and the acad academic or educational uh, and, and research um, sector in the university, higher education sector. Uh, and there might be bi biologists who are working in uh, non-governmental organizations in, uh, uh, in NGOs like Greenpeace, for instance. So the idea is that there's, there's once again different stocks of knowledge and if, if we're able to bring all of them together, we're actually also able to more um, effectively solve problems related to sustainability, responsibility and ethics. And if we're then actually even going one further dimension down and we're thinking about the different fields that run through both the disciplines in the sector, so fields in this case, people doing research, people doing education or professionals in some uh, to some degree uh, engaging in organizing uh, uh, practices, then we're actually able to pro provide a very, very rich transdisciplinary uh, scenario from which we can, can build very, very powerful problem solving research. Good, that was number one, here comes number two, uh, completely different area of research. So uh, this comes from the uh, critical management studies uh, context where we are trying to find out what are the power relations um, that hold certain uh, certain things in place, often things in place that we don't really like. Uh, what are the power relations that possibly hold people down? Um, and one of the, the agendas there that, that many of you will know is the idea of decolonialization, one of the research agendas. Um, the idea that uh, many colonial structures and practices and processes are actually still in place, although we, in most cases, don't have that kind of traditional political, historical colonial uh, uh, structure anymore. Still, there is still a latent colonialism uh, or implicit colonialism, which we could unmask in a certain way. And one of the arguments is that uh, management education and management itself is very much uh, something that is being sold globally as um, uh, something that comes from the West, often that comes from the US, uh, often that comes from uh, the, the UK or other European countries, and then that everybody else needs to do management exactly the way that those countries say. So this is that type of we're talking about. Um, or all, also, if you're thinking about um, different accreditation agencies, uh, which uh, are based in, 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 in those countries, but accredit uh, according to uh, to their own standards around the world, we could also uh, interpret this as some type of colonialization. So the idea then there is if and, and I don't like that. Why don't I like that? Because I feel that alternatives give us give us resilience. If we do have alternatives ways of managing, not just this one perfect dominant way supposedly, uh, alternative ways of running business schools, we are more resilient if some kind of We've got more alternatives to choose from when it comes to things like sustainability. Um, so here the idea would be to see what are actually um, the, the, the typical Arab approaches or practices um, that might be phased out slowly by that kind of colonial dynamic and um, to, to emphasize them, to look at them, to see what can those actually bring if we strengthen them, as opposed to always say, it's just, oh, that's just like the old way of doing it, we shouldn't be, shouldn't be, it, uh, be doing it anymore, or the not modern way, or um, the, the non-Western way, or whatever. Um, so this is the idea for the, the second uh, uh, part of the research agenda. And I think there's a couple of really interesting um, chapters here in, in that book we did last year. Uh, among others, uh, I, I think chapter 18 is very strongly grounded in the Arab region, although it's more from a, uh, a um, religious perspective, uh, the Islamic perspective of responsible management by Yusuf Sidani. Um, so that might be one starting point, but you might also find it helpful to look at the other local perspectives we have here. For instance, I, uh, me being a, being a German uh, person by origin, found it interesting to discover the, uh, uh, the, the honorable merchant, or rather the uh, um, their Ehrenwerte Kaufmann in German, um, and an old way of doing responsible management that I, when I was studying a long time ago in, in Frankfurt, was, was presented as uh, an historic uh, artifact, something that we're not doing anymore uh, by a gray, a professor with a gray beard who looked very legitimately, very legitimate uh, in, in talking about this kind of historical artifacts. Um, but there I actually noticed that this is something that, that we can elevate once again uh, out of my own uh, personal local tradition and, and culture. 
and that can actually bring many positive aspects to the global agenda. And then another example, although this doesn't uh, explicitly talk about um, the, the Arab region, but it is written by people who are from the Arab region, Bima Jamali and George Samara, um, uh, helps us once again to, to start thinking about what are non-Western responsible management or sustainability and management approaches? Um, how do we educate about them? And also the question, um, how can we actually make sure that they're not just being uh, covered up by this kind of Western apparently standardized uh, perspective and the right perspective of doing things and uh, to legitimize them and to, uh, to, to, to get to know them once again to see what they actually can bring. Good. And then the last one came out of a very pragmatic, very practical problem on my side, which is that um, when, uh, when I wrote the second edition of this textbook, uh, Alexandra Barrett and I, who, uh, who helped me a lot with the cases in the book, we were for days on end, we were looking for cases from the Arab region very, very actively. Uh, cases that would be very exciting that we could elevate as, uh, as the top notch uh, responsible management activity or practices in uh, uh, globally as well. Uh, but we could only find one. So this was incredible because we have in every one of the, 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 the 20 or 19 chapters of, uh, of the book, uh, we've got uh, over 10 cases. So how come that we can only find one Arab case if we were really looking for it so hard? Um, so I hope that, that uh, MSAR could also play a role in uh, highlighting very unique aspects in the Arab region um, and bringing them to the, the larger discussion also in the educational context. Um, so how could we do that? Here's just a couple of ideas. Well, we could look out for the flying pig case studies. So flying pig in the sense of, uh, well, nobody ever thought a flying pig existed, but here it is, look how unique it is, um, and changing our, our views on things. So some kind of those extremely unique cases would be interesting to, uh, um, to, to find in the Arab region and to, to cover in the journal. Uh, but then also top-notch novel practices uh, maybe something technology enabled because I understand many of the are in a very unique position when it comes to CO2 and fossil fuels and uh, and also climate wise uh, fine. So there might be very, very interesting um, empirical work to be done that builds on that unique uh, location aspects. And uh, then maybe there's retrovations as well. Retrovations is something that uh, that I got first uh, interested in being in uh, in the Amazon rainforest actually, and being uh, being uh, guided through a a local uh, um, a local settlement, and uh, the gentleman was showing me how they um, nowadays are still uh, using uh, a natural way of refrigeration, which is just digging a deep hole into the into the earth and putting whatever needs refrigeration in there in a very comfortable and very very feasible way, even from my uh, kind of very. Um, technology uh, uh, interested interested eyes, um, and I thought, okay, well, this is this is great. This has been done like this for hundreds of years. So maybe there are many of those retrobations out there um, from a sustainability angle that we can tap into and can bring back in and to make it something that globally becomes an alternative. Um, and then also there might be culturally anchored, uh, unique sustainability or responsibility or ethics. Uh, and management practices like Islamic finance, for instance. One, once again, I know, of course, um, uh, Islam is not something unique to the Arab regions, but so this is uh, me done, I understand. So thank you very much. And um, um, I'm, I'm very excited to engage now into the discussion that uh, hopefully we'll have for quite a while still. Um, but before we do that, please, also beyond the discussion, the live discussion, which we will do now, don't be a stranger. Um, be, be in touch if you would like to discuss, discuss more about the things that we um, that we have come up with here today, um, or if you would just like to follow some of that uh, that kind of line of argument. Uh, connect me on, uh, get connected on LinkedIn. Uh, have a look at the responsiblemanagement.net website. Um, have a look at the new YouTube channel where I understand this one will be posted as well at some point in time. Uh, and where ample resources also for uh, for the textbook, if you want to use that, or just drop me an email. So thank you very much. And uh, again, for inviting me. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion just now. <laughs>